lecture three, uh, let me close this up. Uh, yep, uh, result in a particular place, randomly chosen. And you keep going with that. And you replace it with um, either a non-existing color slash species splash individual uh, uh, with a certain um, a probability with diversification ratio, whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, or you replace it with some uh, nearest neighbor or some neighbor which was uh, chosen with respect to a kernel of a domain of influence for which you choose the most numerous. Or uh, in a mean field sense, whether you uh, choose it from anywhere else uh, based simply on abundance. And um, that, of course, entails neutrality in the sense that the preference is simply due to sheer numbers, sheer abundance. And that's the essence of a neutrality assumption. And the patterns that, uh, that uh, we've seen in there are quite different depending on a sole modification, which is in this case, the directional dispersal, which is embedded in the network structure, the tree-like structure, if you please, or the open to any, uh, I'm sorry, nearest direction uh, from a sorry start back. So let's see how we can exploit this. This is Ignacio Rodriguez Turbe, emeritus professor at Princeton, currently now uh, at Texas A&M. Uh, after like uh, a couple of decades in Princeton, in which he said, well, uh, why don't we uh, assume that each branch of a network structure here uh, becomes like a, a metapopulation, which is called a directly tributary area, but is a local community within a meta community. One of the points that I made in the first class was that the result that um, uh, the directional dispersal, which is embedded in a network structure for interaction, that is, that defines your nearest neighbors or away neighbors in a selective manner, is uh, rather insensitive of whether you're talking about an individual based or a meta community based approach. The result still stands. And what later on we have done, like uh, field uh, verification of the same result, studies theoretical or empirical on migration. Uh, fronts, for instance, that feel the structure of a directional dispersal, or laboratory, in fact, experiments we ran in my lab, in which there was nothing neutral, there was a living community, the results still stand. So the idea is um, here is to assume that the larger the system, um, this uh, elementary the unit on which you have reactions of physical, biological, chemical nature, in this case, biological, could be a directly a um, tributary area, which is a local community carved within the community, like at the rich scale. And um, we thought of doing so with reference to something which is quite important. We took on the, uh, the uh, whole archive of local species diversity of fish populations in Mississippi, Missouri river system. And uh, LSR means local species richness, however defined, essentially can count the observed number of species which you have. So in a DTA, in one of the nodes of the links in which you can partition, I'll be showing you now, you can extract that objectively and manipulate it, uh, I mean, remotely acquire and objectively manipulate the structure of the Mississippi Missouri River system on a grand scale. Um, in a DTA, a fish unit um, can be thought, uh, thought of as a subpopulation of fish of the same species. And you have a number of ways through which you can do that by expert things, by the surveys, by the uh, collection that uh, Bill Fagan, the fish biologist, has compiled for the whole of the United States. And um, uh, uh, the idea, of course, in this case, what you see, in fact, there is um, the color code, the local species richness, which is different from the various places. And what you see here, this AARP, this rather obscure, uh, in fact, uh, uh, acronym means annual average runoff production, which is essentially uh, runoff. I mean, the, the, the total volume of runoff that passes through any particular cross section, that is the hydrology. Now, uh, it doesn't take an expert statistician, but simply uh, a, a, a not a particularly a trained eye to see that there is a correlation between how much runoff you have in a particular place and different directly tributary area, that is the hydrology, the hydrologic control, and the local species diversity. But to formalize this, what you can do, you can extract objectively um, even humongously large networks to detail which is exquisite. In fact, one of the reasons why, in fact, uh, over the debate of critical self-organization, that is why, in fact, certain recurrent characters embedded in a power law distribution of um, some aggregation structure of a catchment is the same regardless of uh, uh, climate, uh, vegetation, 
exposed lithology, the scale, etc. There's something truly remarkable or even networks that generated uh, files like um, or, or data sets like this one in which you can characterize uh, a structure from the scale of one meter or less to the scale of thousands of kilometers and in terms of area even more. So that can be done. I hinted that that uh, briefly in the first class and not touching on it, but I assume that this is something which, uh, well, you can trust me, we've been working for like 20 years in characterizing those network shapes like uh, these ones. So uh, let me see how uh, essentially the model proceed. It's, it's um, well, I have a few notes here, but um, it's not gonna be particularly, in, in, but the idea is that um, uh, it's like the experiment you've seen the neutral meta community or meta population experiment that I showed you in the animation I showed before and I showed also in lecture one. So these, um, um, the assumptions in this case is every DTA, that is every unit is uh, essentially saturated uh, at its capacity. There is no resource available to fish is assumed to be left unexploited. Now, of course, you're talking about some sort of an upper limit uh, to, the, uh, to the fish uh, diversity, but that's also quite remarkable how close I will show you this will be reproduced. So the model dynamics proceed as in the other case, which you have seen, uh, uh, that is at each time step, uh, a, you randomly select a fish unit selected for all the fish units in the, in, the, in the whole system, and you assume it to die. And the resources that um, uh, previously sustained that unit are freed and available up for grabs for a new fish unit. So with a certain probability, which we term again, the diversification ratio, uh, rate, uh, the new unit, the fish unit will, um, will be a new species. It will probably be one minus new. In fact, it's gonna be one of the existing species that colonizes the spot. And uh, the, of course, the diversification rate in this case could represent um, uh, external introduction of non-native species. We have seen how foreign invasions are so important ecologically for a variety of ecosystems, or it could be immigration or re-immigration, in fact, of a new species from outside the region. You have seen the case of the example, if you may recall from lecture two, when we studied the breeding birds of, uh, uh, of North America as a, uh, or the Kansas prairie uh, uh, species or Bassius species, in fact, that um, in fact, they, they, the concept of persistence time, local persistence and local extinction has to be seen in the context of the geographical uh, area in which this is done. So um, uh, with the probability one minus new, the new unit can belong in fact to the, to the species, to the, uh, to the thing, et cetera. And the idea is that in this case, you don't, uh, touch only nearest neighbors, but essentially you characterize a probability PJ, I, IJ, I'm sorry, that the empty unit in the ith uh, DTA, in the ith node, the directly tributary area, whatever you want to call it, is colonized by a species which is elsewhere in the J uh, uh, DTAs that appear in the system through a kernel, a dispersal kernel that you had in the sense, which uh, uh, specifies and measures the range of a species colonization. Now, what is important here is a non-neutral effect, um, which is, uh, however, not dictated by, uh, by uh, a calibration, not dictated by uh, a biological dynamics, but essentially dictated by hydrologic controls because it's geomorphological. So you assume that the habitat capacity determines the resource in the place, is the fluvial habitat capacity, which is established on the scale of the basis of a scaling geomorphic relations we had uh, hinted at, that characterize the fact that um, you can decide based on certain metric properties, which are remarkably obeyed in the runoff producing area of any river worldwide, and are dictated by the aggregation structures. So essentially, the habitat capacity in the place is essentially dictated by how much area you had behind your back, how many nodes do you collect through the structure of a network again, which is a given. Now, what is interesting that the dispersal kernel has certain features of which I shall not uh, uh, discuss, but essentially what you have, I won't uh, study the particular back-to-back -back exponential, which has a tradition in ecology, uh, one uh, or another. In fact, uh, we tested several of them. Um, uh, we were asked by the nature reviewers, in fact, to uh, to run a comparative analysis, and we apparently convinced them because we got published. 
But the idea is that, for instance, if you assume that two uh, units, two nodes, two DTAs are uh, IJ, what is the distance that separates them? Now, that's interesting for colonizers, because if you assume the colonizer are strong fish units, right, um, the uh, path, uh, path that connects you, uh, I to J could be partly downstream and partly upstream, or could be strictly downstream or strictly upstream, depending on IJ. Now, the question is, uh, you may bias the path, because if you are a weak juvenile fish, for instance, a small one, you may be way more affected by the velocity, that is the drift, which is embedded in the stream flow direction, that is the oriented nature of the graph, then it could be for a strong adult big fish, right? So either way, the, uh, you may bias and weigh, in fact, the downstream direction, the upstream direction distances which you have in the system, which makes it reasonable, and this is a tunable parameter in a sense. But in a neutral case, we kill it, and we assume that all species are equally important at the capital. Uh, at, the, at the per capita level. So briefly, uh, the result of what you see in here is in, uh, the frequency distribution of local species richness by letting the model run to stationary state. Now, uh, it may be, uh, you may like it, you may dislike it, et cetera, but for us, it was totally remarkable how simply the nature of a connected, uh, um, of a connected system and the habitat size, which is produced by scaling relations being embedded in geomorphological laws, which is the aggregation structure, um, can allow us to reproduce uh, wonderfully well um, how the alpha diversity, the distance to outlet, I'm sorry, this is, I, I, I made a mistake. I, I was anticipating what I saw in here, in fact. So this is not a frequency distribution. This is the, how the alpha diversity unfolds from the outlet to the upstream distances with obvious differences which you have in a certain place. For instance, um, uh, this is blown out because you may have the, the data are telling you that um, some freshwater tolerating uh, coastal fish species, in fact, uh, could, or human disturbance, in fact, uh, or, or pollution for that matter, um, alter what you would have otherwise a distribution that is what the data show, uh, are showing you in the original New Orleans. And the same applies to the same thing. Uh, at the same time, which is also remarkable, how the frequency distribution with respect to the distance to be out, the frequency of local species with respect to the thing, that is, you count essentially the number of species that are equally distant from the outlet, you got some sort of a range which is reproduced without any tuning by the model, signifying once more one of the main tenets of my classes that um, there is something inherent in the directional dispersal implied by the network structure, which is the substrate for ecological interactions, which is giving the system, granting the system uh, reliability and predictability. What is interesting also is that if you run the same exercise without changing the habitat capacity per every node embedded as proportional through um, predictive geomorphological laws by the uh, structure, the aggregation structure, which is essentially dictated by the total contributing area at any point, deciding how big is your river, um, then what you see, you screw up completely, in fact, uh, the, uh, the exercise. And you see the hydrologic controls embedded in any neutral model, which is the simplest possible zero order approximation. There's no description of, a, of a properties on which uh, fish biology is spending lifetimes of uh, scientific work, um, are mostly explained by the hierarchical size structure of a fluvial network and its embedded topology, which is also reinforcing what uh, we have seen before. Now, uh, things become slightly more complicated if you go into not only studying local species richness by the correlation structure, it is a beta diversity. It is, um, what is the probability that the existence of a species in one place is uh, uh, matched by the probability of existence of a safe species at a certain distance, distance being uh, measured in so-called chemical distance, which is along the network structure. So this can be done. You can generate equiprobability maps, which is the ratio between the number of common species that you have and the species in the central DTA to see how the system behaves, in fact. So this uh, um, reinforces the, uh, the main tenet that I've been hammering on for quite a few times. And I am now ready to um, move on following uh, what Marino Gatto 
has told you about the evolution of our thinking about spatially explicit epidemiology uh, by the original ideas that motivated us to go to jump into COVID-19 studies through the same technological tool in as much as some um, tail, some, some uh, small factories that you had in the Milan area, they used to make uh, um, high fashion dresses, converted their lines of production into mass productions uh, during the COVID-19. It was a relatively jump, um, an easy jump for us. But I'll tell you how, in fact, this uh, thinking, uh, this way of thinking and this line of thinking that brought to the book um, I talked to you about, uh, uh, allowed us to move on to jump from fish biodiversity straightforwardly to the study of river networks as ecological corridors for waterborne disease. Let me see why. Now, um, here's a river network, and let's assume that those dots are uh, human settlements. So essentially what we're saying is that, um, what if uh, we thought nodes are human communities where they are, in fact, with their population and their size, et cetera, where disease can spread, and uh, um, you have a demography of a population, of a, of a demography of a disease based on the demographic evolution of susceptible individuals, infected individuals possibly recovered, and possibly via the, as you've seen in the case of Schisto, quite importantly, um, through the example that, um, uh, that uh, Marino has pointed out, or which I, I'm uh, briefly returning by mentioning his mentor, because it's important for one of the tenets of my work. That is, you may in fact couple this with control variables, which pertain, again, water controlled, but uh, that pertain the ecology of a disease. That is, if you have, for instance, intermediate obligatory, um, intermediate hosts for the uh, development of a disease. So um, why this is interesting, the, the example of a schisto, I will just briefly show the main results that Barino showed you, the helminths, and you see why this is important, right? And I'm, but the motivation I'm giving it, um, it's more, um, uh, it, it's somewhat uh, important. That's where uh, we carried out the field work that uh, we carried out with my lab, in fact, in Burkina Faso, where we had like a 20 year, 20, 20 year uh, long uh, experience in um, a collaboration, in, in a cooperation to development. So um, it, what is incredible in this area is that in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have something like in a debilitating disease, which is not killing anyone, so it's a neglected tropical disease. You have like 15 million uh, disability adjusted life years uh, that to take into account. And what you have in, in the particular regions, you have different types of schisto as Marino has shown. I'm just going through briefly because, and that's what um, we had uh, in the camp that we have uh, in Burkina Faso we deployed and one graduate student in fact carried out his entire PhD thesis on that. Why this is interesting, again, it's a complex life cycle and it is interesting for us, the existence, the need to take into account hydrologic controls. This is the part which indeed um, pertains to how form and function of a river network operates. Because why? Because if you have like this marriage, this fertilization of the successive stages of the of the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, disease need to hatch the eggs, the best place in which they, they are generated within the infected host and they have uh, the worms, uh, the, the flatworms that uh, generate uh, cercaria or miracidia in fact, uh, uh, in, uh, live in the, and they excrete through feces. They get into a water environment in which they have to, um, they have to be infecting snails uh, in a given time. Now. That depends, of course, on shear stresses, depends on the flow velocity, depends on the habitat size, it depends on whether the habitat suitability for the intermediate host is given. So something in which, uh, as you've seen with Marino, uh, will be back into the system. So that's what you have. And what you have seen, and that's the point I'm making. Um, the point I want to make here is that um, uh, pricing the planet, as uh, uh, an environmental economist pointed out, that is, um, if you don't account for a depreciation of natural capital, um, that means that um, essentially the ecosystem services that uh, are carried out that you cannot quantify precisely are worth zero. So pricing the planet means that you have to give a monetary value to the services you may lose as an alternative, like in this case, making way for a, a commercial center by destroying a mangrove swamp um, that means that in the in gross domestic product 
indicator, GDP-like indicators of well-being, you will see the advantage in the following year of the, of the commercial center, of the benefits of it, but you don't see the loss which is associated with the ecosystem services you lose from flood protection to, uh, to uh, carbon sequestration to uh, fish nursery areas and the like. So the idea, and that's part of the Gupta's main point, is that indicators that do not account for the depreciation of natural capital uh, put development thinking uh, stacked against nature, in a sense, uh, against environmental thinking. And the very idea of a, a, a misinterpreted Kuznets curve, that is, that if your GDP goes up, uh, down goes the inequalities in their place, is essentially false as Thomas Piketty, in fact, has shown quite clearly in his wonderful book, uh, uh, The Capital of the 21st Century. What happens is that in reality, indicators that omit the depreciation of our natural capital are totally unsuitable for describing the wealth of nations. And here is my point. Meta studies um, that, uh, and I'm, I'm reasonably sure that Marino hasn't spoken about it, that didn't introduce my discussion, in fact, showed that there is a clear relationship between the expansion of irrigation canals and some of the 15,000 small dams that we have seen. I took this picture near our field site in Burkina Faso, in fact. Uh, the uh, the uh, construction of irrigation channels that uh, were possible because of a 15,000 World Bank funded uh, small dams that uh, litter Burkina Faso, in fact, had the consequences. So the Water Resources Development Scheme of a largely improved GDP of Burkina Faso, but in, in a humongously large expansion of a habitat suitable for intermediate host to the disease, and thus the prevalence of a disease. So the idea is that can we put a price tag on the, a, a learning impairing disability brought in by a disease of this kind? Complicated, complicated. And the, uh, our permanent liability, our, the, our inability to predict for instance, the number, the increased prevalence um, in, in, unless you have significant and reasonable models of the expansion of a disease, then um, you know, as a matter of fact, they won't be able to put a price tag on it. And this is the same place, uh, and this is the pictures that I took in the same place. How could you keep uh, little guys away uh, from uh, the water when you have ephemeral ponds generated by the system. Mind you that uh, in this case, as you very well know, because of the wonderful lectures that Shirley Marino has put forth on the subject, that um, the, uh, the, 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 those larvae penetrate the skin uh, in a matter of seconds. Our student that was here only once put his hands in the water, dropping the gloves, when he dropped scissors, just, he he just uh, and picked up in a second the scissors. That was enough to, grab, to, uh, to get the system in a second. Why this is important and related to what you have seen um, in the uh, previous slides for the fish diversity, and it's a picture you've seen from Marino, because the set of equations, and I'm not insisting on that, is something in which you have coupled, um, coupled uh, uh, ODEs, like in this case is the mean worm burden that you have uh, back in the system here, the prevalence of infection in the intermediate host, in this case is Y, and these are the, the uh, essentially the densities of a Cercarie and Miracidia in node I of a, of a DTA, that is of a single node in which you can characterize the system. I'm not pretending that you follow the system, but you realize that in here you have a number of extensions which are quite important. They pertain, for instance, human mobility. That is, if you have a guy that migrates to go to a place to cultivate a field, uh, uh, because of the expansion of the irrigation network. Human mobility does affect, in fact, carrying away an exposure and the concentration of sarcaria that generates the burden of disease in an individual. That's how the system expands. So in a sense, you realize that you're moving the study of diseases onto a plane which is completely different. And the set of system is a classical system through which used to uh, engineering, environmental engineering tools. And I want uh, build on that, in particular, not on what you have seen uh, with Marino about uh, how you characterize the stability of the system and uh, uh, possible uh, uh, ideas you have on how to curb it. Uh, again, this eigenvector analysis you see with Marino is telling you essentially how 
you can actually generate the patterns of disease. And what I really like is the idea is that you can also make discussions. What happens, for instance, if at random, as an exercise we ran, um, uh, you remove 10% of a small dance, thereby reducing the distance, the mean distance to the nearest water body, which is arguably the uh, most important factor of completely geomorphological origins that uh, generates the exposure. So, and that's the experiments we had in the place, and I'm not building any further, uh, or uh, other diseases that can be treated in this manner. What I'll be concentrating here, I mean, getting back to the first slide in the last 20 minutes of my, of my lecture, and then i am be delighted to answer your questions. Uh, um, you remember the little guy here on the banks of a Magna River, uh, where uh, we did field work on chronic, in fact, cholera, I'll be talking about epidemic cholera in a minute, was trying to convince me that uh, it's impossible the mighty waters of a, of a Magna were the cause of cholera, which originated in that region, in fact, evolutionarily, um, and then from there irradiated worldwide in several waves of pandemics. But most significantly, 200 meters downstream of the largest diarrheal disease hospital in the world, uh, in Bangladesh. Now, um, the point I'm making, and I'll be carrying out to the end, is that um, the inherent predictability that you grant the system by using uh, directional dispersal embedded in the uh, known a priori and calculated and treated objectively offline, remotely acquired and objectively manipulated offline structure of a river network, grants an unprecedented predictability to disease of this kind. And in particular, this became uh, um, absolutely vital when um, uh, we uh, uh, started. We were just working on that. We had published the first spatially explicit model of um, epidemic cholera uh, in, uh, with reference to the outbreak that was in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa based on data that were uh, uh, collected much afterwards in hindsight. But what happened is that on October, uh, uh, in the week preceding October 10, 2010, all of a sudden, in a country where it was cholera free for more than 200 years, you've got um, an outbreak which started propagating downstream the Artibonite River in the heart of, uh, in the, heart of uh, the Haitian island, uh, the island of Haiti, the part of the left, not the Dominican Republic, which is cut in half. Good example that Jared Diamond, um, in fact, in his collapse, uh, wonderful book, was making an example of how, in fact, uh, the unprotocol scene and the bad management of resources uh, explains uh, the uh, a, a, a not simply environmental factors uh, determine, in fact, the fate of societies. Now, what was interesting, you see, the number of cases jumped all of a sudden from day zero to day from 50 to 100 to 200 in places which are small places indeed. And right downstream of a UN camp of peacekeeping curves. What is not only ironic, sad, and it's, it's really uh, uh, affecting me uh, very much, is the fact that why we were peacekeeping troops in Haiti? Because a few months earlier, Haiti, the poorest country in the world, had been struck by an earthquake that killed 300,000. It destroyed the little infrastructure that was there. Uh, uh, sewer systems were non-existent. Uh, roads were destroyed. People died. Um, a, a civil uh, infrastructure was demolished. It, was a, it sits on a, one of those plate tectonics on which uh, earthquakes can be particularly devastating. On top of that, we planted the disease because it was shown when it was mapped the genome that it was a Nepalese strain of cholera when it is endemic brought in by asymptomatic uh, peacekeeping forces. Anyways, that was a fantastic exercise in a sense, because in a completely naive population, as that's a term that you use in these cases, um, uh, they, um, uh, but is, uh, or you can assume safely that because uh, no sign of cholera was there for almost 200 years, that the entire population was susceptible to the disease. And what happens is that then you had thousands of deaths. You had the mortality, initial mortality, which was totally remarkable because there were roadblocks to treat people transported by poor means, like uh, uh, on the shoulders of a, of a younger, in fact, to be treated to centers, there were roadblocks to make it. And uh, say, uh, like after a year, like 8% of the population of a million people was uh, uh, affected. And this is a picture I took into a hospital in Leogan, 
Uh, and you see what was essentially the treatment was even, I have to say, among the sanctity that I've seen in the Médecins Sans Frontières hospitals uh, organized in the haste in the place or the Cuban brigade that took up the north of the country to assist, but essentially put people on the stretcher, you cut a hole in the thing and you collect the stools like six times a day. And what is totally remarkable that uh, you survive cholera easily if you only have hydration bags to which you should be attached. Now, uh, let me show you the evolution of the daily cases in Haiti for about a year and a half, then the thing becomes blurred afterwards, but that's quite interesting. So you have um, uh, the evolution of the daily cases in the half of the Hispaniola island, this is a part of Haiti, and I didn't put the data which came uh, later on, in fact, for the two islands that still belong to the same place, etc. So this is how the disease, in terms of simply record reported number of cases with all the inherent errors you may have in the system, and what you have in there, this is the city of Port-au-Prince. Here is a log scale of a number of cases. If I'm asking you, what do you see here? Well, you see the rivers. So you, even by seeing the most gross indicator, number of reported cases, what you see in the place is that the, the avenues uh, of the uh, riverways where the pathogen, in fact, survives in the environment, uh, in the open waters, in fact, is what generates the system, et cetera. So essentially, you can't have something in which you essentially can calculate the rate of change of new cases of cholera um, in every single um, place that, um, uh, that you have, but you have to take into account a spatially explicit system. If you put settlements where they are, connectors where they are, and the likes. Not only that, if you take the red curve, is what happened in the first uh, wave, followed like in COVID, but for completely different reasons, a second wave, which is clearly related to factors like the tropical rainfall that you have in the place. Um, why? Well, the easiest is not simply an overflow of sewers, but simply the washout of open air defecation sites, which you have to take into account. And the fact that um, the freshly shed bacteria, the bacterium, in fact, um, like a single infected individuals, expels and, and through, the sp through feces, like a hundred times more bacteria that in, in concentration, which are orders of magnitude larger than any, any possible uh, um, uh, survival in the environment. So it is the human human host, in fact, the main uh, reason of a propagation, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, whether it moves or not. If you have a, a susceptible person moving on to the wrong place, drinking the wrong water and getting back, he brings back the disease. It happened to me when I was in the market of Artibonite. Um, uh, well, I'll tell you when I show you a picture later on. So the tools of the trade now is knowing ahead of time where settlements are, where patterns of rainfall evolve, and how the disease can be uh, predicted uh, under these conditions, putting uh, cities and human settlements where they are connected by the waterways as we can see them directly. So the idea that um, in a system like that, you have two different networks, a network which you, which you have like uh, pathogens connecting nodes, if they are uh, downstream, of a, uh, of a river system, or, and that's a key place, you can have connections among nodes, human communities in which with population, each population, each sub I, this is node I, in which the disease can diffuse and grow, connected by a multiplex network of a different time, of a different kind. In this case, human mobility, as you now very well know from Marino Gato's lecture on COVID-19, the spreader, the mean mechanism, whatever its shape uh, it is. And, but we had seen even uh, in my set of lectures, what happens when we consider from a zebra mussel um, invasion of the Mississippi, Missouri river system, you see that you saw that at times unconnected flare ups of, uh, uh, of uh, those uh, development of those clusters of zebra mussels were generated away from the main backbone of a hydrodynamically generated um, uh, uh, dispersion. Why? Because of the ballast water in which Veliger survived, where were taken away and, and tucked um, to different places, maybe hundreds of kilometers away from the same place. The mechanism of generating the system of this kind.
So uh, the tools of a trade, uh, in this case, are the tools of a trade of geosciences, of digital information systems, or geographic information systems, if you want. That is, um, we can, and we could do it remotely when we predicted the uh, evolution of a, uh, of a epidemics of cholera in the place, which I'll be showing you in a minute, because the digital terrain map from which you extract the river network, as I hinted at, in my introductory class is something we can do. It's a standard exercise that, uh, uh, that master students do uh, where we are. You can have pixel-based estimate of population density. You can have modeling of human mobility, which is something which requires some thought and some care, in fact, uh, generated, maybe simplified at times, but tell you what is the capability of attracting places like on the main point, like port of plants that you have uh, in this system. And the set, the tools of a trade, I mean, they different every time, but the, that's why I showed you before the ones that Marino has shown you for Shisto. Um, so essentially the state variables are susceptibles at node i at time t, infected at node i at time t, and the bacterial concentration in the reservoir of the i-th community uh, evolved because of uh, the different factors, which is the mortality, the survival of the vibrio, in the environment, which is a certain mortality, the rate of sink, really how long you can survive, or transport um, a, in a certain proportion, uh, coming from connections that are hydraulic uh, and hydrologic connections, that depends on the various sizes of the, of the water reservoir, the local water reservoir, which is important because essentially you can assume that one stool, a single infected person has a certain probability distribution but in terms of absolute number of, uh, uh, of bacteria shed, which is again six orders of magnitude more than you have uh, for the concentration of bacteria in the free living waters. And that is the infection thing that generates the thing. You see, P, the infection per unit infected person, which is here, you have a, the force of infection depends on the local infections plus the of infections connected by a mobility matrix. This is a mobility factor which you have in the system. So, of the I persons that live in a community, uh, I sub I infected person, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, stay there and pollute the water. Or you may have persons that because of mobility and its matrix of fluxes generates the infection shedding to the place. To which you could possibly add, like you have it here, the rainfall runoff production of uh, vibrios uh, generated by the system. Again, I cannot pretend to explain the details, but you see how this is done, for instance, um, and you have seen in the introduction to the disease um, e ecology that uh, Marino put together. In this case, we assume the time scale of our prediction is one in which recovered persons, I mean, are put back into the susceptible compartment over a time which is one of a row of the order of two to three years. And this is the force of infection that depends on a number of factors. My scope here is not to it's get you curious about uh, the structure, but you see that the structure is exactly the same of a schisto, is exactly the same of a Mississippi Missouri biodiversity model, and it's exactly the same of the ones we have seen before. So uh, let me show you how the model works. If you assume a, a piano network, very important, because if you have like in every node, you have a population of the same capacity, all of them uh, uh, prone to have the diffusion of the cholera, uh, uh, that's what you will have in the system, right? And why this is interesting? Because it calculates the speed of a traveling wave of cholera under simplifying assumption, which depends on the local reproduction number. But if you assume as it is uh, meaningful and, and, and reasonable, the distribution of it in a topologically connected system of this kind, you have uh, that node distribution, the population distribution is taken, drawn from a, a, a distribution, which is normally, I mean, almost universally, a, a power law of exponent minus two, the zip distribution. What you have is that, um, now, what you see in the system that uh, you have flare ups in a mechanism which is exactly the same. And why? Because that's the effect of factors that can be uh, uh, remotely measured and objectively uh, manipulated. In this case, the population size. And certain effects of the delays that you have in the system, spatially explicit, have nothing to do with the disease and everything to do with the geomorphology and the ecology of the system. So I took to Haiti a few times uh, and uh, what uh, these pictures I took, they are kind of blurred and I love pictures, but the reason being is that um, my, uh, my glasses were shot 
because people could kill you to steal your camera because there's no police left in the place. You have no sewers, no streets to speak of. And this also shows how large patterns of infection are accompanied. You consider this safe water, bottled water, with the guy that handles them uh, by the neck in this case, quite remarkable. Or there are places, he's taking in the, again, in the Bangladesh counseling instead, in which uh, the water reservoir, which could be a highly abstract uh, phenomenal parameter of a system, in the case of urban setting, possibly proportional to the population, or in this case, you see it, or a very physical system like you have in Bangladesh, as I was telling you. And this is the market uh, of Carrefour in the outskirts of, um, of uh, uh, Porto Prince, where I've been sitting in the system. And, and what I told you, and was totally remarkable, is this lady which you're seeing here blurred against because of a, of a safe glass beyond it. Uh, in a matter of second, um, uh, Bought, bought a cabbage at this guy, and I couldn't, I was speechless when I saw it, by showing uh, a Nokia 1900 proof of concept. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Nokia 1900 telephone as a proof of payment. So in a place in which you have no sewer system, as you see it, water flows through the market in this case, you have no roads, you have no police, but you do have a telephone, which is a way less uh, uh, biased, uh, socially biased system as we have seen. And this is how, in fact, human to human transmission, this is public transportation in Haiti, in fact, takes a place. <laughs> and that's the last uh, thing that I want to show you that um, uh, models and data, in fact, uh, uh, we are not perfect uh, modeling things, et cetera. I mean, you have Bayesian estimation of parameters, but the very fact that you're using specially distributed uh, um, <coughs> quantities uh, makes sure that in reality, the distance between model and data is so small that operational decisions can be taken based on that. And I'm skipping this part because it's too late. It's Marino Gatto and his idea that in, in spatially explicit uh, 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 models of disease development, in fact, you can have even um, a, an eigenvector can represent the pattern of disease before it happens. And quite interestingly, you show also that the local reproduction numbers, meaning uh, the test for the potential for the outbreak to occur is neither necessary nor sufficient a condition for epidemic disease outbreak if you compare it to real cases. Whenever you have a spatially explicit system in which human mobility is a driver, not is an embedded driver, but it can be calculated. And I skip uh, this part. I skip also this because I, I realized they chatted too much about how uh, proliferative kidney in fish can be studied. And I jumped um, uh, from the last two. Uh, uh, fish diversity in that case and, and the deadly infections in fish are in fact a proper into the channel network. There was no other network to speak about. So my conclusions, the whole, the general conclusion is that um, eco-hydrological footprints of um, river networks as ecological corridors are demonstrated. They are pretty strong in fact. And from peaks of prevalent in waterborne disease infections to any kind of large scale patterns of species abundance and biodiversity, or even the susceptibility to biological invasions that we have seen, uh, it's all in the water. So in a way, it's written in something which could be remotely acquired over, over virtually uh, six orders of magnitude and um, remarkably compelling. So in a sense, towards a fair distribution of water, which is my punchline, that is the, uh, attaching a price tag to certain things which weren't um, material, uh, materially or observables in economic terms, but they are absolutely vital because they don't have a way of predicting what would be the impact, for instance, of, the, of a, an expansion of water resources um, uh, 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 exploitation patterns in the uh, expansion of a disease, for instance, its cost. So they open um, the uh, a quantitative, they open to a quantitative evaluation on ecosystem services uh, to rethink, in a sense, um, social equality. And I thank you uh, with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, we can open the floor for questions. Yep, off the screen. Yep. I have a, a quick question. Yes, please. Um, in the in the model uh, 
towards the beginning when you show the uh, alpha diversity increasing as you go downstream, um, is this is this increase and uh, consequence of accumulation of species going down because they cannot migrate upwards, or is it a consequence of just more populations interacting and getting uh, going together? Uh, they, they, would reduce the number of canals downstream. It's a good question. Uh, the canal for, for dispersal species are the same everywhere. What makes the difference is the fact that habitat size and thereby the carrying capacity of a population of every three species changes uh, with respect to the downstream direction because of a natural accumulation. So it's an external factor which is dictated by the aggregated structure of a network that gives an inherent predictability, even though, I mean, how could you possibly uh, consider all fish species equally uh, equally capable of dispersal, for instance, or insensitive to drift uh, at the per capita level. And yet, neutral pattern um, uh, doesn't require neutral process. That's what I'm saying. So the neutral patterns are uh, more general. That's what, uh, in fact, uh, famously Purvis and Pakala would call. And if, I, if I may just a quick follow up, was that pattern completely monotonic? I, I noticed it was not, it was not a, a straight line. It was, there was some... No, that's a, they, they, you have to see the two patterns uh, together. So one is the frequency of uh, species distribution uh, with respect to the distance to the outlet. Uh, so essentially you count the number of sites which you had at the same distance from the outlet. It's a fairly complicated structure. So essentially it opens up and it closes up. And, uh, and, uh, and the other one is essentially the, uh, simply the, you simply measure the average, that is the local species diversity, you have a different distance from the thing. Of course, if you are interested in the catfish distribution, the neutral model won't work, right? So you have to go into a serious model of the thing. But if you look at large scale patterns, for instance, for uh, conservation reasons, the, the, the neutral pattern gives you robustness, reliability, and the capability to make decisions, actually especially for conversation, for, for conservation practice. Okay, if there are no further questions, Antonio, I'd be delighted to go because I have another meeting fairly soon. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs>